So hello, everyone. I'm here today with my friend and colleague, Terry Cochran. Uh, let's see. We, we have a bio here, but I feel like it's hard to define you, lady. Terry Cochran is an integrative practitioner and thought leader in sustainable health and longevity. She's the founder of the Global Sustainable Health Institute and has developed the Cochran Method, which integrates a multi-level bio-individualized metabolic health modality. Terry specializes in complex health conditions. She also serves to maximize the human potential in ballerinas, professional athletes, and Olympic hopefuls. She practices in the Metro DC area, and she is the author of a groundbreaking best-selling book that came out in 2018 called The Wild Atarian Diet, Living as Nature Intended. So welcome, Terry. Thank you so much, Bridget. So good to be with you. Yeah, I interviewed you quite a, a while back about Epstein-Barr virus, and we're going to have, I don't know, a related conversation today in the, in the wake of this coronavirus pandemic, because you've got this history of viruses, vi you know, experience with viruses, as I mentioned, your bio with complex illness. A lot of my audience is asking questions like, I have this condition, I have that condition, how does it, you know, play in now with this coronavirus? So I'm excited to talk to you and answer some of their questions about kind of an advanced approach to this virus so maybe I'll start out first off like what are what are just your impressions what's your what's your big impression of what's going on right now and how we can approach approach it from a healthcare perspective well this is a novel virus and we're still trying to understand how it behaves and it's behaving quite differently than other viral strains that we've been used to and have world immunity up against. And so it's really important that we seek to continue to share the information among the healthcare practitioners within our community and beyond so we can cross pollinate information and disseminate it as holistically, comprehensively, and uh, with calm as possible. So this is really such an emerging uh, time that information is being disseminated in real time. And as we continue to catch up with it, I was just sending an, uh, a piece of information that I had learned to a very respected doctor who's a pulmonologist out of um, Carlsbad, California, and is a viral expert on what our latest finding just revealed and how it impacts the way that you support staying away from the virus. Um, and if you get it, what you absolutely do not take, it's not just what we should be taking, but it's also what should we not be taking that we would otherwise take for a viral load? That's a question I'm getting a lot too. I, I got a question today. Is, is, is it true the elderberry is bad to take? I've got a question on what if my immune system is overactive? And I'm not quite entirely sure how people are deciding their immune system is overactive, but it's a fair question. So I don't know if you want to dig into that piece you learned about what, which you, what we can and cannot take. Yeah, so we can go right into the meat of it here, and then we can ask sure. if they you know, want to move, move different in a different direction. So one of the things that has been recently spoken of late is um, supplements that increase interleukin-6. Uh, interleukin-6 is an immune system response in the body. We usually like to increase that. However, and I just read a study specifically to COVID-19, and I'll be happy to share the link. This is literally kind of hot off the press with uh, your audience that if we have increased interleukin-6, it exacerbates the, the outcome of the virus. And so they also shared that reducing interleukin-6 helped reduce the virulency of the virus. So what does that mean in layman's terms? It means that herbs that we have otherwise used in the past to help support the immune system may actually be contraindicated here. Now, because this is all very emerging information and we don't have the clinical trials, right? Um, we are looking to be as pragmatic and as information gathering as possible. And so as this information is emerging, because there is related information around that, my specific uh, recommendation is if it may not be good for us and we can avail ourselves of something that is benign or good for us, then go there. Don't mm -hmm. go that way. And so what's really interesting is that Typically elderberry, which I have always recommended 
for flus because it does help dismantle the influenza virus. In this case, elderberry increases interleukin-6, has the potential to increase interleukin-6, as does, as does astragalus and ashwagandha. Mm. I'm also, and, and why is that important? So why does, what happens with this interleukin-6? Well, it increased mast cell response. And mast cells are these little balls where histamine is held. And if you have a massive mast cell response, histamine is released and in the body and, the, and for the COVID-19, it likes our lungs. So it's having this massive mast cell response to the lungs causing potential lung damage, atrophy and respiratory failure in the, in the most severe cases. And so I've taken that one step further and we're coming out with an ebook, which we will share for free for everyone in the next couple of days. We're working very hard in our practice while we try to still see fully. I hear you. <laughs> um, to bring out information as comprehensively, as calmly, and as um, up to the minute as possible, knowing that these things are changing every day. So I've taken, as you as you you know about me, Bridget, I, I am a consummate researcher and going down to the thread of the thread of the thread where the thread originated. So if you take the thread of this, this virus likes histamine, this virus likes to feed on things that creates a mass cell response, then anything that's going to increase our histamine response can be problematic, right? So, and that's why what people are saying is, if I have an overactive immune system, is this hurting me? In my practice, I look at histamine as a neurotransmitter response. So yes, histamine can make us more anxious, right? It can make us itch. Now, typically histamine has more of a dermal, epidermal response where we get itchy, we get you know runny nose, and um, we have a, a response that creates um, runny nose and inflammation as the body tries to defend itself through histamine. But this virus is very smart and it's actually using histamine against us. And so what I'm saying, which is actually counter to a lot of my colleagues, uh, but I still am going to follow the thread. If anything resist, raises histamine response, I'm saying stay away. Probiotics tend to his mm -hmm. increase histamine response, right? Mm. Bone broth tends to increase histamine response. Fermented and sprouted foods tends to increase histamine response. So I'm saying put those aside for now and look to for example, vitamin K that helps create a probiotic or look to non-FOS um, um, type prebiotics such as astragalus, excuse me, asparagus. Um, or a prebiotic. Yeah, okay. so a prebiotic, not a probiotic or help, you know, help that gut become <clears throat> really important in the in its short chain fatty acids with actually butter, butyric acid, if not butter, butyric acid, right? So what we want to try to do is lower the amount of histamine response. DAO is a massive antihistamine. I'm recommending as part of the protocol quercetin as this antiviral because it has bioflavonoids and it is a wonderful antihistamine. And it also helps seal the tight junctions of the gut. So quercetin is a really important thing. So what I'm looking, how I'm looking at this virus is that let's try to lower the histamine response do not feed it with anything that has inner, that will promote the, um, the body's um, making of interleukin-6 because histamine and mast cells, anything that lowers mast cell response, I'm looking at too, chromalin. Um, I think that uh, nasal crom is, is an over-the-counter mast cell. Nasal What's crom. that? I've never heard of that one. Nasal yeah, nasal, crom. It's, it's over-the-counter, but it's basically chromalin. Chromalin is a mast cell stabilizer. Okay. Interesting. So when you talk about histamine response, interleukin-6, is this the same same stuff that's making the cytokines? I'm getting a lot of questions about the cytokine storm. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. We okay. Don't, we don't want to increase cytokines. They're inflammatory responders for us. Yeah. And I, I, what I've said so far that, you know, in my research, I'm like, well, if we're looking to kind of quell inflammation, I like fish oil and I like magnesium. Yes. And they're also ni nice for other areas of the immune system that are regulating. Uh, I was lucky that kind of early in this process, I talked to a colleague who did a lot of vi virology study in school and he was talking about herbs as well, that herbs as, as opposed to like vitamin C or, fish oil are, have, are different mechanisms 
you know, more complex. So he was talking about, like you've talked about elderberry. There's, it seems like there's different, there's different species and types of elderberry to stem versus, I don't know what we normally use here, which species or type, uh, but herbs are more complex. And I yeah. think that that's kind of what, what, what mostly within our computer community, there's some agreement to be careful with. I really agree with that. And so part my my protocol recommendations is really seeking to avail ourselves of vitamins and minerals that are going to modulate. So we're talking about immune system modulation, not activation, because again, there's this fine line of what's going to be too much, right? It's going to hyperstimulate the body. And so, oh, I just locked up. Um, I can hear you still, so you're just video is locked. Okay, let's see here. Uh, I should. There we go. Okay. Okay. Um, so we want to be we want to be really mindful around what calms the body. Magnesium tends to have a calming. It's also an anti-spasmodic, and with people that have had asthma and bronchial spasms, actually high doses of magnesium tends to um, lower the bronchial spasming. Anything that has high levels of L-arginine, for example, um, <clears throat> um, artichoke, to help increase nitric oxide levels. Why is nitric oxide important? Because it helps, it helps with vasodilation. And right now, when you're coughing, you're having a massive vasoconstriction, right? You're, you're mm. spasm. And so uh, foods that are high in nitric oxide or artichoke itself, I actually just created a... Um, uh, wild lights, which is three ingredients, uh, and I believe it's it's proven to be extremely efficacious. It's just watermelon, um, watermelon, cilantro, and sea salt. But what it does is it has high levels of arginine, which is really important for increasing those nitric oxide levels, which is super important for cardiovascular and respiratory function, both of which are important in this time. So things that increase nitric oxide are important. Now, nice. go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Having said that, if you have POTS, um, posterior orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, you're already producing too much nitric oxide. So oh, it's okay. for, for the vast majority of us, where we're bronchial spasm, okay. nitric oxide is important. Okay. Yeah, I have a little asthma, seasonal asthma from my mold history, and I'm perimenopausal, which is the ripe age for, for this kind of thing. So I've been really hitting the magnesium and the fish oil, and it makes you know, I haven't been needing my inhaler. It's making everything calmer, which makes me feel better, you know, right. in this time. So, so I think it's a, it's a big win. So one of your specialties, you talk about amyloid plaques and biofilms, and that's a kind of a region people don't know as much about. Why do we need to know that in reference to this virus? You know, Bridget, it's really interesting as I reflect back, it's, it, it, it's, it's as if, me creating the wildetarian diet and movement was preparatory for what we're experiencing now. Mm. Um, I became very ill two and a half years ago with what turned out to be over five viruses lighting up like a Christmas tree in my body. And that was the time that I was actually writing my book, The Wildetarian Diet. And it really informed the authorship of the book because the, diet, the, the book speaks to how autoimmunity and um, is being really ramped up in chronic conditions through amyloids and mycotoxins coming from the food supply. Amyloids are truncated indigestible protein structures for, that exist in domesticated animals, the tissues of them. And what we're finding is studies out of Japan and Cambridge show that chicken being the the dirty bird, as I call it, carrying a concentrated amyloid count are reactivating viruses. And mm. since the since my wildetarian approach was birthed and has been lived out through the thousands of clients I've seen since its um, origins, we've been able to modulate autoimmune conditions such as Hashimoto's thyroiditis which is linked to Epstein-Barr. And that was one of the reasons I came on to your show the last time as knowing that when we can turn off these or deactivate these viruses through the food supply, then autoimmune conditions tend to become rebalanced. And so why is this so important now? Well, we don't wanna feed anything that's gonna feed a virus. 
Mm. Now, again, this being a novel virus and acting differently, it's still a virus. And so what can we do to lower the amyloid count and then lower the mycotoxin uh, load in our bodies. What we have found through the studies that we, we found in the clinical literature that are actually located in my book, there's about 400 citations in the bibliography of the book, is that amyloids will, will reactivate viruses. Biofilm, which is that which covers the pathogens of candida and strep and other bacterial and fungal pathogens will increase the amyloid burden, which then increases the viral burden. And the amyloids will also make biofilm. So it's, it is a ping, ping, ping ponging mm. effect of these pathogenic loads really being intelligent and defending each other against our favor. So what does that mean in terms of how we should eat? Um, one of the things that I'm saying, and I'm really following this wildatarian protocol, again, through the thousands of clients that have benefited, that have rebalanced Hashimoto's and Bell's palsy and ulcerative colitis and, um, oh my goodness, any autoimmunity, um, uh, Crohn's and um, even uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, right, which has been linked to the varicella virus now. Um, when we instructed our clients to follow a low amyloid, low mycotoxin, wildatarian approach, they became rebalanced. And so where are the myco, where are these amyloids found, potentially found? Okay. Chicken, beef, pork, and turkey. And so what, what we've seen in the news is all these meats have been, you know, just gobbled up from the grocer's shelves. They have been, yeah. And, you know, we may be inadvertently, not in every case, and I can't say this is, you know, we're all bio-individual, but if you have latent viruses and you're feeding them and in the stress response that everybody's living into, we know also that stress will increase the pathogenicity of these bacteria and viruses. Also, it opens the tight junctions of our gut, which increases um, the leaky gut. And it mm. releases epinephrine, which I call the cupcake, which is a fat and a sugar. We also know that viruses feed on sugar. And this one in particular likes, likes a dysregulated system, system where in the, in the face of dysregulated um, sugar handling. And so it's really important that we look to minimize this and how do we do it? We have found through the, our clinical outcomes that wild game such as bison and elk, antelope, and then the wild fish and shellfish contain lower amyloid burden. And mm. when that occurs, the body responds. Also, they're, they're easier to assimilate and digest. Now, having said that, if we are all under um, limited resources in our grocer's shelves and these wild game meats are difficult to find, then I'm suggesting now that the, a strategic plant and fish-based diet might be the way to help quell the feeding uh, of amyloids into our body. Okay. And so yeah. speaking, speaking to the plant base. Okay we have to also be careful of plants that don't contain mycotoxins and now also plants and uh, legumes and, and nuts that are not high histamine. So can you define mycotoxins for us? Thank you. Mycotoxin is a fungal metabolite, which is, it tends to be a fire starter for pathogenic loads. And it's typically found in corn. It's clearly found in peanuts. And, one of the things that I've shared with my with my audience is that please don't um, please do not did I lose you rigid No, I'm here. Okay, can you see me? I can. Yeah, okay. I might have just got covered up. <laughs> there we go. Um, please don't buy peanut butter. And as a as a great you know non perishable item, peanut butter is an aflatoxin. I call it a, a mycotoxin on steroids. Uh, peanut butter has high oxalates. Oxalates can feed candida, which is a fungal organism, which then can feed biofilm, which then can feed amyloids, which then can trip 
increase the, the vir virulency of viruses. Um, pea, pea protein may be contraindicated right now. Green beans, those things that have potential mycotoxins, they're not good for us. And so what do we do instead? Sun butter, why do I like sunflower and sunflower seeds and sun butter so much? Sunflower lecithin has been shown to reduce epinephrine. Epinephrine is that adrenaline which increases our stress response, right? So it's a really nice calm, mm. calming element. Um, corn is just not good on any level. It's got it's got corn, it's got sugar in a mycotoxin, and 90 over 90% of it is genetically modified in the US. So those things that can be fire starters to our gut along with amyloids are things that we should consider staying away from in, in the near term and, and maybe in the longer term. Yeah, and some of my audience may be familiar with like a, a low mold diet. For some reason, I thought you said microtoxins at oh, first. No, no. No, I was like, what are <laughs> mycotoxins? Okay, <laughs> yes. I agree. It's funny. I hadn't had peanuts for years, even before my mold diagnosis, just because I had heard it was moldy. But recently, um, my partner was buying peanut butter for our son. Like we hadn't had it in years and they were like, oh, peanut butter. And so I had some and woo, that made me feel real bad. Uh, it was quite, you know, I think it wasn't the first couple times. And then my body kind of like, you know, got the load. The load <laughs> was then going and I was like, whoa, no more peanut butter. So yeah, that's one I'm careful about. Um, yeah, and the corn is, is a great suggestion. I remember at Trader Joe's, like, everyone bought all the chips. What? <laughs> My friends are joking, like, what? What are we surviving on chips? <laughs> like, that's not a great plan. No, not at all. <laughs> okay. So we talked about some foods to avoid. Um, any foods you want to have people kind of, we talked about sun butter look for clean seafood, like wild seafood, look for anything else we could be looking for that maybe other people are not buying. Absolutely. So vitamin C is really important right now. It is an antioxidant. It's it. The viruses don't like vitamin C. When I was really sick with my viruses, I was taking high, high doses of vitamin C, five to nine grams a day. I'm not recommending it for everyone, specifically if you have any ulcers because it's acidic. A mixed ascorbate tends to be buffered. But we need to look to those fruits that are high in vitamin C. Strawberries are high in vitamin C. Of course, our citrus friends. And unless you have candida or strep or another um, fungal organism, oranges are actually quite good. And it, oranges seem to be specifically efficacious against the cytomegalovirus, which is the one of the tranches of what creates mononucleosis, which is another one of virally induced um, conditions. Um, bell peppers are really high in vitamin C. So vitamin C is really important. And then rose hips helps to increase um, the assimilation of vitamin C. So we're looking to, uh, vitamin C is being sold out in many, many mm -hmm. of our suppliers right now. Yes. So what I'm suggesting, if you can't avail yourself of vitamin C, rose hips still available, buy that. And then you can use food and rose hips to help increase the assimilation of vitamin C. Another thing that's uh, really important is selenium is super key right now. Selenium is a precursor to glutathione. Glutathione is a master antioxidant. I had conversations with a brilliant Dr. Todd Ovakaitis over the weekend. He is, he is a master, master researcher. He's done so many clinical trials and had so many patents. He's, I believe he's just one of the genius men, uh, humans of our time. And um, we were talking about how important glutathione is in, in epidemiological studies, how it lowers the viral, uh, viral capacity. And so Brazil nuts, uh, which is, uh, are really high in selenium, is a precursor to glutathione. Uh, selenium is a precursor to glutathione. Again, back to the fish, it's a precursor to uh, fish are really high in, is really high in selenium. So if you're not going to take selenium or glutathione, then that is important. Now, glutathione in the past, you may have heard me speak of saying, wow, that, well, that's a sulfur compound. And if you have impaired sulfur processing, then that could actually be agitating. What I'm finding in this course of current state, unless your nervous system is already really jacked up, um, and, and if you have 
either the CBS gene, this is the thione beta synthase gene, or the SUOX gene, both which relate to sulfur uh, metabolism processing, which then increases nervous system response, along with the COMP gene, which has to do with how we metabolize dopamine. Then I'm actually advocating for some dosing of glutathione. Um, and if not, then uh, definitely selenium, again, being that precursor. So back to foods, again, fish and um, those vitamin C sources, and then certain nuts that have um, power, if you will. Cashews are high in molybdenum. Molybdenum helps with the sulfur processing. Um, almonds are really high in vitamin E, which is a really good way to unpack vitamin A. And vitamin A is super important in healing the epithelial tissue of our lungs, which again, what is this virus looking to? It's looking to our lungs. It's looking to attack our lungs. However, this is a big however. If you've had candida, if you have mold, if you have certain genes for impaired oxalate metabolism, almonds are a high oxalate. Mm. Okay. So look to other foods that contain vitamin A and E. And that's again, back to fish. Krill oil is really good um, for vitamin A and E. Even I, I recommend it as opposed to cod liver. Mm. Why? It's cod such a big fish and it has bioaccumulation. Oh, right? okay. That's a good and one. Krill, krill, we just did some research right before I went online in terms of how it's um, assimilated in the um, intestinal lining is much more, it's much more bioavailable. Mm. Great. These are good tips. And some of these things, yeah, may not be sold out. I have a lot of nuts in my freezer, you know, that I just keep there. So one of my person of my staff was getting worried. She's in New Jersey and this shopping is pretty restricted there. And I said, well, what, what do you have for smoothies? Like probably if you're a health nerd like us, you have a lot of different smoothie ingredients, got hopefully nuts in your freezer. And yes. Uh, yeah. And, and you know, it, one of the things that probably hasn't been sold out is watermelon seed and watermelons are really, again, back high in arginine. And so watermelon seed protein, watermelon seed protein has probably not been sold out. That's a really good thing to have in store. Hemp seed protein, that's 22 grams of, of uh, protein per um, couple of scoops uh, on some of these plant-based proteins. So what we want to try to look for are foods that non-perishable, that are really high in vitamin C and selenium and glutathione and vitamin A, natural vitamin A in, um, that have antiviral properties. And so mm -hmm. one of the big um, vegetables that, are, that has many studies related to its antiviral properties is tomatoes. And so mm -hmm. buying you know, whole tomatoes, Roma tomatoes that are you know, not fresh canned or just freeze them, uh, big, big antiviral. Uh, constituents there. That's kelp. a great tip. Kelp. kelp. Also, okay. You know, so you can buy some uh, kelp uh, or dulse paper, right? That can be crumbled on salads or into soups. That's really high. Kelp um, has been uh, touted to even uh, be broad spectrum to almost, I believe, se 17 viral loads. It's efficacious against 17 viral loads. So kelp is really, really important also really, really richly mineralized. Mm -hmm. And so what does this virus attempt to do? It attempts to demineralize us by making oh. us dehydrated, right? And so minerally rich foods are very important. And that's why coconut water with its uh, electrolytes are important. The sea, back to seaweed and seafood, high, high mineral content, very important. Yeah, you know, people have been over the years focusing on, you know, nutrient dense foods, which, you know, I, I hope we have like high fives to everybody who's been in this community a while, because if you have just been eating the standard American diet, this is all a big surprise to you. Uh, but hopefully my folks have had, got, you know, got some stuff in their, in their pantries. That is great. We just came out with a greens powder this month on our shop and broccoli sprout um, capsules that like I, they were just coming out anyways, but uh, that's a great thing to have around right now. Is green absolutely, sprout. absolutely. And you know, beans are great at the low mycotoxic beans. So I don't love peas. Okay. Peas are not good for us folks. They're in that peanut family, but I do like chickpeas. That sort of gets pulled out. As different, an cat, different thing, right? yeah. 
and, and they're really high again in molybdenum, which helps with impaired sulfation and sulfur, the sulfation pathway in liver detoxification is really important because we have to help ourselves detoxify. Otherwise our histamine loads go through the roof and then the virus gets mm. really rapid. Um, that's a great tip supporting detox to kind of manage histamines. That's, yes, I like that exactly. tip a lot. Okay. And so I really like, I really like chickpeas. I really like Pinto. I really like great Northern. They tend to be in our practice. We've really seen, again, this is all empirical, but we've seen that they have certain antiviral properties. The body likes them. So okay. important. And then what I also found to create a complete protein, because we still need to get our protein is I really love the black or the mahogany rice. Mm. Why? Because it's the highest protein of all the rice, but two, it it's, has as much resveratrol as blueberries. And why is resveratrol so important? Again, back to antioxidants, back to that detoxification, back to supporting our liver, back to reducing oxidative stress. Okay. I think I have a bag of black rice because it's like you buy it. <laughs> You're like, oh, what am I? I never got around to using that. That black rice I bought. Yeah, that's great. I love I love these shopping tips. I'm gonna just go look for a minute for questions. Francis, if you have a question, can you put it in the chat here on the right? I'm taking some notes that we can uh, gather. Let me go look on Facebook really quick. I'm drinking my vitamin C right now. <laughs> Good job. I'm drinking my magnesium. Okay. I have some tea with cystus and lemongrass and awesome. I do have Epstein Barr and, and asthma and and I was kind of nasty when this was all starting you know with I did a lot of traveling this winter and like it was just like spring and winter were smashing together here in Arizona so I was pretty flared up and honestly studying all the supplements and just getting these reminders like everything's feeling a lot calmer I will say like if I'm stressed too much caffeine not enough sleep boop, you know, can come back up. And then right. and, and, a, and a point to caffeine and coffee also, it's just a reminder, whoops, that it's a vasculoconstrictor. So we don't want to do anything that vasculoconstricts us too much because again, this, this little villain, I don't even know what to call it. I haven't named it yet. I, I don't, I try not to give it a name because then it gives it strength, but um, COVID-19 likes to likes to act on the things that vasculoconstrict us because it's going to increase bronchial spasming which is going to uh, increase our cough sorry i was looking for a question what did you say was a vasoconstrictor coffee can be a coffee okay i can't drink coffee anyways for very i don't think i break it down, generally so. coffee it tends to be higher in mold now it our friend dave asprey mr bulletproof that's the only coffee i drink because it's a low low mycotoxic coffee Okay. Yeah. That's I'm not saying true. don't drink coffee. I'm just saying be, just be mindful. If coffee races your heart, if you're feeling a little tense after coffee, um, you may want to follow it with our wild lights, which is going to give you nitric oxide. Well, let's, uh, Francis asked the name of your book again, and you mentioning some supplements, if you can say where people can find those. Absolutely. So the wild vegetarian diet, like vegetarian, wild atarian, living as nature intended is found on Amazon and you can find it. It's both Kindle or uh, print. Um, okay. Hard, hard copy. And the supplements, the wildlife, you can find through our website. I've also developed an, something called an immune mover and we've just been, we've been selling out of it or not selling out, but selling so much of it because we have found, I, I developed this supplement. It is a broad spectrum antimicrobial, and we've just had a tremendous amount of efficacy related to specifically the flu. Uh, our clients that have been taking it have really been um, just um, incredulous on how, how efficacious it is. And so it's been roundly applauded in the community that has been taking this for the last 18 months since I rolled it out, almost actually been longer than that. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah I rolled it out 2017. I rolled it out in 2017. That's right. Right as I was getting sick, as I was really sick. That's how we do learn, right? We learn by working on ourselves and, and doing the research. Um, exactly. Yeah. So that's called the new mover. And, okay. you know, I just had one of one of our mind share peeps say, I, I want to buy this for my entire company, you know, for right. all the employees. Right. Um, so just really, you know, just really supporting, supporting something that's, that's um, very, very um, beneficial in terms of being an uh, immune support overall. Okay. And that's on uh, terrycochran.com. Oh, Terry okay. Yeah. 
so Anne is asking a question. I, I don't think it's exactly related to COVID, but um, she's asking. So we'll help her out. She's saying she's 57, postmenopausal. She's having hormone imbalance, pain in the joints, especially thumbs and fingers and losing elasticity if you have any tips for her. Okay, so if you're having a lot of joint pain, what, what, I, what I recommend to all of your listeners is you go to my website and take the quiz to find out what kind of wildatarian you are, mm. what wild type you are. Typically, if you're finding a lot of joint pain, there could be some impaired sulfur processing mechanisms. So actually, um, cabbage and cauliflower and kale, we call it killer kale, could act, those things that are high in sulfur could actually be hurting you. Mm. Elasticity has to do with our body's ability to have a, a collagen matrix structure. So we need to make sure that you're availing yourself of fats. And what happens is post-menopause, we don't break down fats very well because the liver gets a little bit congested uh, mm. as we um, aren't producing those hormones for detoxification. So I really like BioSil. Um, it's really great for silica. Um, I actually recently uh, broke my wrist uh, and it was a very complex fracture on a first day of vacation um, oh, in no. Hawaii during the holidays. And I'm, I'm back. It's wonderful. I had to have surgery on it. But what I found is, you know, again, all of our, um, you know, sometimes all of our little foibles create opportunity for learning. And I developed a collagen supportive bone healing uh, protocol that has been really unbelievable for me. And I was lucky enough to be, um, have a surgeon that works for the Washington Wizards and is a risk specialist here in the DC area. And he couldn't believe how fast I had healed and how, how quickly the inf inflammation had gone down. So my special protocol for what your, um, your audience member is asking about, you know, just placidity in the, in the skin is rebuilding the collagen. How did I do that? I did that with Boswellia. First of all, it's a natural oh. anti-inflammatory, plus it helps with bone health. The stronger our bones are, then we can build muscle around them and it's going to help us stay stronger. I also did high amounts of zinc and vitamin D, vitamin K, and then I did hy hydrolyzed collagen along with quercetin um, to help with bioflavonoids and, and silica. And that has just been for me, not only did it build my bones back really well and quickly, because I'm just like three and a half months out, I shouldn't have even been pushing any weight and I'm actually doing now wall pushups, um, which is really remarkable. But my hair got thicker, my eyebrows got thicker, my nails got thicker, my skin got more supple. That means the collagen, collagen is improving in my body. And so that's, you know, for flaccid skin, we want to improve collagen. And when we do, our bones get stronger and our joints don't hurt. So that's a really good protocol. Yeah, I've been taking Wendy Myers Ageless AF. She's a very sassy name. That's an <laughs> advanced silica <laughs> supplement. I know. I'm like, woo, Wendy. Uh, I've been taking that. I do collagen. So call it silica, uh, collagen, vitamin C is a good combo. And then you've mentioned a few other things to, you know, mix in there as a as a nice combo. So I love that. I love that. Um, this has been great information. I knew you would throw it down. <laughs> you know, that's where I'm really, what I'm also really trying to bring to the table and it's time consuming to do this research, but I'm like, if, if I'm going to recommend this or that, like I want to look up the dosage and look up, you know, yeah, I find some great stuff, you know, and I, it drives me insane how like the NIH is saying, oh, there's, you know, there's no alternative treatment. Well, they also run PubMed. They host PubMed. It's got tons of information. Right. We might not know a ton yet about this virus because it's right. so new. There's, you know, people say, well, what's been proven or said, well, it's so new, but there have been studies on other coronaviruses and so many studies on viruses in general. Um, Exactly. And I think what we have to do is we have to extrapolate because that's all we have right now. Yeah. Just the function of extrapolation and following the thread because we are, we don't have time for clinical trials. We are acting in real time. And so what we do know is if this virus likes histamine and mast cells, I'm going to stay away from anything that gives me histamines and mast cells, right? If yeah. I know that, if I know that in my practice and in the wild vegetarian diet that we've seen such an incredible results by going low amyloid, then I certainly am not going to eat amyloids for this virus. So, and, and, and if we know that mycotoxins be, be biofilm, which feed amyloids, which uh, reactivate viruses, I'm not going to do mycotoxins either. 
So again, it's just really following the thread of if this then, and Bridget, you know, I've developed many, um, my methodology, the Cochrane method, that that's how I built this method. If this then, if this then, and, and it's, it's this, this, like, it's a tree of, okay, decision point, decision point, decision point. And, and being ever vigilant, mindful, and ever thirsty for knowledge. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing the research. You know, maybe we'll touch base again in a month or so, because I'm sure we'll know more <laughs> by then. Right. Yeah. And take care of yourself while you're doing all this work. Same. Yeah. And I'll publish this to our, our newsletter as well, because this was a great, and we planned this pretty last minute. So maybe people aren't catching it now, but I'll, I'll uh, republish it so people Wonderful. catch it later. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Thanks for people who are on. Appreciate it, everybody.